All right. Um, so uh, anyway, G Gary had uh, asked me to to help him with this class, and it turned out I think some headphones. Uh, it turned out that he was um, looking for somebody to fill in for a few specific times that he knew he was going to be out. So that's why I did the last one, and then this one. And we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, sin, uh, kind of the study of sin as a whole, as as a unit, and. Um, we are going to start with uh, sin pre-Eden, basically. Uh, that's where we're going to start off. And what we're talking about here is the idea about, uh, about Satan and, and who he was as, as, a, as a being and um, kind of how we, we ended up where we are as far as sin goes. So a um, couple of points real quick. Satan um, was... We all are familiar with the idea of Satan, right, being a a fallen angel of sorts, right? Satan was in heaven, he had pride, and he kind of uh, esteemed himself equal with God and ended up uh, being cast out. And we'll, we'll talk about some of that, but it, I think it's important uh, if we look at certain verses that we see just kind of how far back all of this went. So if you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 for me real quick. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And we see here that... Um, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, if you sin, you're of the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. From, you know, like all the way to, to the beginning of time, right? We, we kind of have this understanding of, of who Satan was already. Um, we see some examples of his particular sin. If you look at 1 Timothy... If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, uh, <clears throat> we see um, an example of, of Paul talking uh, here, and he, and he mentions that if we are puffed up, right? If we're puffed up, then we fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So the sin that Satan had, originally at least, was that sin of pride. That is, that is a thing, and I think we... we <sighs> Hillary gets on to me because I tend to throw myself under the bus a lot when I, when I talk or give a class or, or have a lesson. I feel like if I have particular issues with something and I mention that, it makes uh, it a little more real and understood. Um, pride is one that I struggle with uh, mightily. I'm going to mention this a little bit uh, again later. I think I can do anything, right? And, and that's just kind of always been my mindset, and that's something that I have to work on as much as I can to try to sort that out. So that is... That, that this kind of verse here should be a real uh, lesson to me, right? Don't be prideful. The devil was prideful, right? Don't be like Satan. Um, and, and that's something I have to, you know, and I, and I think we all have to work on. Uh, upon sinning, Satan was cast out of heaven, and we can look at certain verses as to why, but we kind of understand, I think, the fact that God uh, lives in a state of holiness. God can't be around sin. He can't abide it. He can't just say, well, okay, Satan's doing this thing that I don't really like, but I'm going to let it slide. So, Satan sins, he's cast out. Now, now we see examples um, of this. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 14 real quick. I just want to kind of get this out of the way. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse, starting in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, uh, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Um, I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So, it seems to be fairly evident that most of this is talking about an actual... Uh, king of, Babel, of Babylon. That this is not unique to Satan, the being. Uh, although, I would make the argument that that could be a secondary interpretation of it. We, we saw the last class that I taught in here that some of the Psalms of David had, while they were talking about him and his struggles, right? David's talking about himself and the things that he's dealing with. If you look at some of the wording there, it's, it's, it, it's an exact example of the things that Jesus went through, Right? So it could be that, these, that this wording is here for, for both to some, to some extent. Um, we also know that other creatures were, uh, that, that also sinned were cast out uh, with, with Satan, and they're basically locked, 
in Sheol and in, in, in hell, for lack of a better term, uh, and, and they're there until the end of time. Okay? That's all pretty straightforward. And Satan continued on, right? Satan started off sinning from the beginning, and he continued with it, and we see that right at the beginning in the book of Genesis. And uh, we see uh, kind of some interesting things, and I, I've I watched some different videos, I read some different commentaries on, on the way people view this, uh, there's some interesting ideas about the way that Satan expressed uh, his questions to Eve, right? When he says, you know, is it true that you can't eat of these trees, right? It's almost like he, he's, he's working her into a situation where he knows she'll come back uh, and kind of further that conversation. She'll give him some, uh, some way in. Um, so he's uh, insinuating certain things. He's adding leading questions to this and, and just kind of general slyness, I, would, I guess you could look at um, so in Genesis 3, verse 1, uh, he's, you know, is it, is, is it true that God said you shall not eat of every tree? Uh, and then that leads to her saying, well, we can. We just can't eat of that tree that gives him an, you know, a way in to, con- to keep going with that conversation. Um, to me, though, uh, and, and let's look at, that, at his approach here, Satan's three-way approach to getting Eve to sin. Uh, and, and we see this in uh, 1 John chapter 2, and I think we're all familiar with these terms, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those same things are basically mirrored back here in Genesis. Uh, For the lust of the flesh, she saw that it was good for food, right? It was pleasing to the eye. It's good for food. Um, So we have the lust of the eyes and and the, the, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life because she notices after Satan tells her this that that food would... um would make her wise, right? Satan says, you're not going to die. This is going to, this is going to open your eyes and put you on, on the same level as God when it comes to what you know, what, what you understand. Um, so she has these same things that kind of lead her uh, down this, this path of, of sin, um, and she fell for it. We see similar examples uh, in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 4, when Satan is tempting Jesus, right? Tempts him with bread. Tempts him with... Uh, you know, jumping off the temple and all these people would see you, right? And they would know who you are. Or, I can give you all of this. You won't have to die, right? Uh, and, and he's tempting him in the same sort of way. And Jesus uses Scripture and the fact that he's uh, Jesus to, uh, to avoid sin in that case, right? Uh, and one thing I want to look at real quick, if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I think this is, is worth just sitting on for a second. Um, all right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I think a lot of us look at these situations and we think to ourselves, well, I, there, wasn't, there wasn't anything I could have done about it. I was in this situation and I gave in. I mean, that's clearly what Eve did, right? Eve was tempted. We've looked, we've looked at that, and she gave in to it. Did she have a way out? I mean, clearly, right? According to the Bible, that no man can be tempted beyond what he can control. Um, I say that to, to make sure that when we're in these situations that we're not trying to make excuses for ourselves. I can rationalize just about anything in my own head, um, and I don't want to find myself in this sort of situation where I rationalize the sin that I've committed, as opposed to saying, yeah, I got in that situation, I could have gotten out of it, here's how I could have gotten out of it, but I didn't even try. Right? <clears throat> Alright, let's talk about the, or the origin of sin uh, on earth. First off, why did man sin? Does anybody have any ideas on that? I know this is not a talkative class in general in the auditorium. It is very hard, by the way. When I sit in here with Gary, it's just hard to speak up in here, right? To yell out across the auditorium and half the people can't hear you, it's odd. Um, but any input on that? Okay. Uh, so why did man sin? First off, and, and this, this would probably um, be the example that I would agree with the most, uh, the desire for knowledge and freedom. Okay? And, I, and I've already mentioned my general issues with pride. If I was in this, case, in, in this sort of, of, of state where things were great, but I didn't see myself as even understanding a, a, 
a little bit as far as, as the wisdom of God. And I've been told you will get this wisdom of God or something close to it. Your eyes are going to be opened. You're not going to be, be hidden anymore. That would be enticing, right? Uh, and I think that's a really big part of, of why he sinned in the first place. Um, so it's that, it's that concern about self over God. And, 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 then, and there's a constant struggle there. Uh, and, and I think that's true of, of most sins in our life. Uh, but I think that is why a man sinned in, in the first place, the main reason. Now, some would ask the question, and, and if you get in, in any discussions with uh, people that don't believe, uh, you'll run across this, uh, why did God have this as an option? Why did God have a tree there where he could sin? Why did God not make man incapable of sin? I, for one, as a parent of, of a four-year-old, I could, I could tell my computer, I could set up a program on my computer so that every time I go in in the morning and I turn it on, that it would tell me it loves me. Does that mean anything to me compared to my daughter running up and telling me she loves me? What would we be if God made us incapable of sin? All you'd be is a pre-programmed robot. There's no choice there. And I, I for one, can't understand why God would be interested in, in that kind of being really worshiping Him. Uh, so, to me, this has never been a question that made any sense. I, I don't understand why anybody asked the question. But, if we're incapable of sinning, you're basically a machine, in my opinion. You're not, you're not a man. Uh, and I think that's cl- clearly there. God wants people to choose to worship Him. God does not want people to have to worship Him. Does that make sense? Alright, let's look at some of the results of man's sin. This is, uh, most of this is in Genesis chapter 3. Um, let's, let's just read some of that real quick. This is after they have, have eaten. Um, verse 7. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So already what's happening here? What's different now? What do they, what, what do they have in this case? Um, shame, I guess, would be a good way to put it. There's something that I need to hide, I need to cover up. That was not in, in their mind at all beforehand. So as a result of sin, we now have, have you know, shame and, and uh, a lack of innocence, you could say. Right? My daughter will be getting ready to take a bath and she'll just run through the house naked and she doesn't, she doesn't care. It doesn't mean anything to her at the age of four. Right? Uh, that innocence was lost at this point. Um, in verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. Uh, Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. They were guilty. Right? They felt guilt. They felt shame and fear. In, in what was happening, what they had done. Um, in verse 10, uh, Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So fear, all of these things, right? Shame, fear, uh, sorrow. If you look in, in later verses, verses uh, like uh, 16 talks about the pain in, in giving birth for women. In verse 17 and 18, the struggle that a man would have in fighting against the ground in order to, uh, to grow crops uh, and to provide for his family. Uh, so, all of these things happen because of sin, and probably the most uh, glaring one, right, um, we have would be death. And if you look in verse 19, there's a good example of that. Um, at the end of verse 19, uh, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So, because of man's sin, we have all of these bad things, right? Uh, shame and sorrow and guilt and fear, and then death. Uh, in addition to everything else. Now, Gary, on, this is from Gary's notes, and Gary mentions this, and, and I, I love the fact that he has this on here. As a result of man's sin, not only do we have all of these bad things, but he also mentions the hope, for man's, uh, the hope for man's sin, or the hope for man's salvation, right? That would not have been necessary before this, but because of sin, now we have this hope that's given to us. And if you look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, um, I will put enmity between you and the woman, uh, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is a uh, discussion about, about Jesus and, and versus Satan, and, and kind of moving forward with that. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, jumping a little bit. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Um, also interesting verse uh, that kind of gets back into this. 
I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. So Jesus, because of this, because this death that was brought in due to the sin of man, now we have Jesus as an option uh, to fight against it, right? He holds the keys against Hades and death. Um, I just think, I thought it was uh, very good that, that Gary had that in there. So not only is bad brought into the world, and as a result of the bad, the good, right? Uh, a requirement to deal with the bad. Now, let's talk real quick. Um, let's move a little bit further with this consequences of sin. And if, if you have listened to Gary when he talks about sin, and he's done this a few times from the pulpit when he's mentioned it, uh, uh, no, I'm not in a particular spot. I'm not going like verse by verse. Right now, I'm about to be in Genesis chapter 2 again. All right. Am I, am I, maybe I'm talking too fast. Hillary gets on to me for talking too fast when I'm, when I'm speaking. Yeah, because uh, I don't know if I get, get nervous and just kind of start going through it. I also have a lot of uh, material here. Sorry, I'm going a little too quick for everybody. Um, Okay, so what we're talking about here, the consequences of sin further. All right, and, and, and what I want to talk about real quick are a couple of viewpoints about death brought on by sin. Okay? If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, uh, 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. I want to read it just to make sure. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. If you ever listen to Gary speak on Sunday mornings or whatever about this, he usually mentions some Hebrew phrasing, mat to mat, when he talks about this. And we see this when we're looking at our translation. It says, You shall surely die. This is an, what they call an infinitive absolute in Hebrew. And basically it says, if you look at the actual wording in Hebrew, what it says is, dying you shall die, right? Um, it is, it, to me, it's, it's basically slapping like an exclamation point on the end of something. <clears throat> it's, it's making it more potent, uh, the wording there, if that makes sense, okay? It is not just used for dying. It is used throughout Hebrew in other words. It could be eating you shall eat, and it would basically mean you're going to eat a whole lot or you're guaranteed to eat, right? It's an emphasis, on this. So, looking at that though, that phrasing, dying you shall die, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. If you look in Genesis chapter 3, did Adam eat of the tree? Yes. Did Adam die? Okay. Okay. Uh, if you didn't hear her, she, she said uh, it began the process of dying. I think we can all agree on that. We'll talk about that and some other viewpoints. Okay, um, there are, that phrasing in Hebrew is used in a lot of places. We will not read through all of them. Uh, Exodus nineteen twelve, Leviticus twenty verse ten, Numbers thirty five sixteen, where you see that surely die. Okay, dying you shall die, mot to mot, um, as as the Hebrew says. Uh, it is some people's opinion, and, and this is a valid opinion. Um, if you look in Numbers chapter 15, we see an example. Numbers chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 32. I'm not going to read it all for time's sake. You see an example of a man on the Sabbath day that is out picking up sticks, cleaning up his yard, whatever, however you want to look at that. <laughs> and the men take him, and they take him before Moses, because they're not 100% sure if what he's doing is wrong or not. They know they're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. What do we do here? So they take him in front of Moses. And Moses says, hey, you've broken the law. We are not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so you shall surely die. They immediately take him out and they stone him. Okay? It's, so it is a common understanding that when you see this phrase, you shall surely die, that it is most often used to represent kind of an immediate, violent, physical death. Does that make sense? Okay. So it is of some people's opinion that when God says in Genesis chapter 2, if you eat of this, you're going to die, that that is an instant Death. You are going to physically die at that particular point. Their argument would be, that what you, to your point, right, that he began dying, that, eh, that that doesn't really make sense because he got like another 900 years out of it, right? Adam lived for a very long time. So how do they reconcile that? Um, well, let's keep, let's keep looking. Um, 
If we look in Genesis 3, verse 15 again, we already read this, and this is where we talk about uh, Jesus and, you know, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, right? So we know that because of this sin, there's some involvement in Jesus in this. And then if we look uh, in Revelation chapter 13, I know we're jumping around. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, this is kind of the, the crux of this viewpoint on, on it. And I'm about to get to what... written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Okay. Jesus was slain from the beginning, or at least slated to be, right? It, it was God's sacrifice in His blood basically protects and, and covers up for the sins of those forward and back. Right? So the idea here would be that Adam and Eve were supposed to die an immediate physical death, but that Jesus was Jesus' death was interposed in their place. That is that is a viewpoint that a lot of people have. Um, said on that day and Adam began the tree of knowledge. Okay. What? Including the tree. Sin, they would have continued to live. And that this sin of theirs caused them to be kicked out of the garden. They lose access to the tree of life. In essence, their death sentence has been signed. They are going to die from that point. It's guaranteed. Does that make sense? So there's a couple different ways you can look at this. I don't know that any of it... Does it matter if you believe one of these versus the other? Not really. I find it interesting, and I like to discuss things with people. Um, I, would, I would add, for the people that have a problem with the mot to mot meaning instant physical death. Uh, if you look at Numbers chapter 26, verse 65, and then we'll move on from this particular topic. Numbers 26, 65. For the Lord had said to them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. So there was not a man left of them, except Caleb the son of Je uh, Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of Nun. They shall surely die in the wilderness. Plural form. Did How long did it take them to die? And up to 40 years. You could make the argument that it does not have to be, every time you see that mot to mot, uh, that it doesn't have to be an instant physical death or within a very small, a small window of time. It doesn't really matter. I found it interesting, uh, and you may have a discussion with somebody about it. Anybody familiar with that phrase? It sound it basically means the same thing. In a sinful people because their parents were sinful people and man is sinful. Right? As a, all have sinned. Uh, look at First John chapter five, verse three. First John chapter five, verse three. For this is the love of. 
The point of this verse here is that it is our duty God's commandments. And at that point, we have done something wrong. Um, sin that I've never really given it a whole lot of can't find Ezekiel uh, uh, Ezekiel <clears throat> the soul who sins shall die the son the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked. In the Bible that fly right in the face of this idea of, of that I don't, I don't understand how anybody could believe it. If you go back and study some of this in history, um, a lot of this deals with people that are the church was all powerful. Uh, these people had no way to deal with it, and in society, right? Um, in direction, right? In order to try to it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't really understand it. We see plenty of examples of Jesus telling We should try to be like. If, if sin doesn't come into us just because we're born, how does sin come into man uh, as an individual? How does sin come into me as an individual if I'm not born with it already in me? Uh, easiest way to look at this, James chapter 1, verse 13. James 1, 13. Uh, and we'll read 13 through 15 real quick. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So, this goes back to this, kind of this, this thing that we saw at the beginning, right? Eve had a desire after talking to the Um, so she has that desire that we deal with. You know, we look at how how a man, an individual, gets sin. Right, if he's not born, you know that you shouldn't do something, and you're enticed by something that you know you shouldn't do, and you fall for it. Right? I mean, we saw that earlier. The sins of the wicked are beyond the wicked. Right? It, it's it's up to you. Uh, but we're all going to have it happen to us at some point, right? We know that, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, now, there is a, a phrase here on, on, uh, from Guy in Woods that I think is, is interesting. Improper desire. In this wicked union, sin is... ...into vigorous manhood, and it slays eternally him... Right? Spiritually, right? It separates us from God. It keeps us from that eternity in heaven. Uh, far from blaming God with the results of sin, he who sins should recognize the fact that he is the begetter of his own sin and the ancestor of his own demise. Which I think is a fairly poetic way to look at this, right? You, we are our own worst enemy when it comes to sin. Uh, this is not something we can blame anybody else for. Um, we have a great example of this in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. <clears throat> Starting in verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord of, uh, God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. 
Uh, he coveted it, and he took it. All against God's will. God did not want anything that was here to be taken by, uh, back by the, Is- the Israelis. Right? He wanted everything gone. Um, but instead, Achan kept some spoils for himself. Uh, and, and again, that's the same thing that we saw with Eve back at the beginning. She saw, she coveted what it looked like, she coveted, coveted what it could do for her, she took it, and she ate it, and therefore died. Right? Uh, now, this next section is a little confusing to me from time to time. Uh, Gary's slide has this listed as, uh, sin is a violation of conscience. Yes, I, I, I kind of scratched out the is and I put can be. Uh, sin can be a violation of your conscience. Um, real quick, so we'll understand what I'm talking about, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. <clears throat> but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. This whole section here, this is Paul talking about uh, eating uh, meat that was sacrificed to idols. Uh, Paul was like, I'm okay with it. I'm not going to do it if it's going to bother somebody else. And his point here at the end is, if you think it's wrong to eat meat sacrificed to idols, let's say it's not, but you think it's wrong and you do it anyway, what have you done? Then you've sinned, right? That would be wrong. It wouldn't be wrong for Paul, who has no problem with it, to do it for himself. But even though it's not wrong... If you thought it was wrong and you went against your own conscience, then you would be sinning. And I, and I find that to be uh, interesting. Um, I think we need to make sure that we don't take this beyond this context, though. Um, for a couple reasons. One, you can't go f- too far the other direction and say, well, my conscience is clean, therefore I have not sinned. Because I think it's clear that people can sin and not feel bad about it, right? Right? Some people can sin and have a clear conscience even though they're actively sinning. It doesn't mean they're not sinning, right? Um, we see this in like 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 2. Uh, speaking lies in, you don't have to turn there, but speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, and then Ephesians chapter 4, uh, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. These people are beyond feeling. They don't even care anymore, right? So this wouldn't bother their conscience that they're sinning, but it doesn't mean that they're not sinning. We still know that these people are doing the wrong things. Right? Killer, let's say, isn't going to feel bad. Uh, so you can't go that direction with it. Um, and be, just be careful with this. The, the reason I have issue with this is because I think we can find ourselves in a situation where we're not entirely comfortable, Right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that you'd be sinning if you took that action. I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, we, you know, we, we, telling somebody something you know that they shouldn't do or whatever, but you're not really comfortable with it, that's not going against your conscience. Okay? So don't use that as some sort of like fallback crutch uh, to, to avoid doing something that you should do. Um, this verse is simply saying, if you think something's a sin, you think it's wrong, don't do it. Okay? Um, Oh, uh, a better verse, honestly, I almost skipped over this verse. John, uh, book of John, chapter 16, uh, verse 2. Uh, this is a really good example of the people that could be sinning despite not thinking that they are. Uh, and I'll give you another example real quick. But um, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Who else do we know in, in the New Testament thought he was doing what God wanted? Paul. Was Paul sinning when he was putting Christians in jail? Yes. Right? But he had a clear conscience while he was doing it. Paul didn't know that he was doing anything he shouldn't have been doing. doesn't change the fact that he's still sinning. Okay? Um, continuing on, let's, what we're talking about now are, are things that, that are sin, right? Um, and this next one is knowing to do good but not doing it. Uh, Look at James chapter uh, 1, verse 22. James 1, verse 22. 
but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Um, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If we know what the word says, if we know what we're supposed to do, and we choose not to do it, what are we doing? We're sinning. And, and you can take that real far, and I think we probably should more often than we do. If I know that a friend of mine at work is in, a, is in a lost state, and I know I should talk to that person, and I continue to not talk to that person, I am sinning. And that is a hard thing, I think, for a lot of us to come to grips with, right? To be able to admit that to yourself. And we can make as many excuses as we want to, but if I know what I'm supposed to do, and I refuse to do it, I'm in a state of sin. Um, that is not a fun topic, right? That's, that's a hard thing to, to kind of understand sometimes. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. If you know what's right and you don't do it, let's look at this. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You have to do, right? We have to actually get up and do something. Um, Know the Bible, right? That's one of the things. We need to know the Bible so that we know what God wants of us. We need to know what our duty is here as Christians. We need to know right from wrong so that we can apply this to our lives. Um, sin is any, any sort of violation to the law. And I have another issue here with this particular one. Uh, not in the way that I uh, live, but my understanding of this. Turn to Romans chapter 4 for me, please. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. I need to do more study on this particular part because I don't really grasp it sometimes. Um, Romans four fifteen. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay. Uh, so, one, the, well, the one thing I know we can take from this is, if I have a law, right, I have a list of rules, and I do something different, I break one of these rules, what have I done? I've sinned, right? I've broken, I've broken that rule. That's easy to understand. My problem with this uh, <laughs> is, I guess the idea of, of like essential morality uh, kind of is, is where my mind goes. I don't know if that makes, makes any sense uh, phrasing-wise, but I do feel like you could be sinful outside of a specific set of laws. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like, from the beginning, if you didn't have the law of Moses, and I did evil things, I'm still doing evil things, right? That's still sin. So I have a little bit of trouble kind of understanding this particular verse. But that's on me. That's not on anybody else. Um, but the point here is, if we have a, a list of rules, if we have a law, and we know that we have old biblical law, right, for the, um, the, the, the Israelite people, uh, for the Jews, and then we have... Christ's law uh, of the church. Um, we know we have these things that we're supposed to do. Don't break them. Uh, and then do the things that we know uh, that, that we are told to do. Um, and, I mean, we've got like two minutes. So let's real quick uh, cover a few more things, and then we'll get, uh, give like three minutes. Um, there are some uh, other words that you see used here to talk about sin or kind of to mean the same thing. Uh, we see the, the, the word transgression a lot uh, in the Old Testament. Um, pesha is the Hebrew word for that, which means rebellion. Um, and I think that's, that's fair, right? We have this law and we are choosing to rebel against it. We're choosing to like, actively act against it. Um, setting oneself against the will and law of God uh, is the way that that's worded. Um, and then you've got iniquity, uh, chata, uh, defined in Young's concordance as to sin or to miss the mark. Uh, and I think we see those used differently, right? Transgression and iniquity. I mean, they, transgression, iniquity, sin, we kind of lump them together. But I think there is a difference in, in like open rebellion, uh, transgression, and general kind of iniquity. I'm, I'm not doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm missing that mark a little bit. But they all do the same thing, and these are the things we talked about at the beginning, right? The sin separates us from God. It results in the shame that we saw from Adam and Eve, the worry, the fear, and ultimately death. Thank you. I'll see you all next week.